I think we're ready to uh, call things back in the session. Um, have the uh, pleasure of introducing the Novel Influenza work group uh, this afternoon. I'm playing the role of uh, Doug Campos Elgicult, who is unable to be here today because of a family issue. Uh, but we uh, are thinking of Doug here. The rationale uh, for the Novel Influenza uh, recommendations are that there are two FDA licensed uh, uh, vaccines for the uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza H5N1. And uh, there is a need for recommendations for use during inter pandemic periods, uh, and especially for those uh, people who have an increased uh, risk of exposure. ACIP was seen as the most appropriate body to develop recommendations for these vaccines. And this group was formed uh, uh, beyond the seasonal influenza group uh, because there is a lot of things that uh, they have to do uh, and have enough on their plate uh, for this to be done in a separate group. This group formed back in February of 2014, uh, charged with developing recommendations for the use of influenza A, H5N1 vaccine during interpandemic period. The work group members have included uh, Dr. campos uh Dr. Karen, myself, uh, and then a number of our liaisons, consultants, uh, and ex officio members as well. The policy question is, should licensed influenza A, H5N1 vaccine be recommended to adults with increased risk of exposure during the inter-pandemic time period? Uh, if yes, determine the exposure and define the recommendation. The uh, progress to date is we have been meeting at least monthly, sometimes more frequently than that. So we've had 11 work group meetings so far. Uh, at this meeting, Dr. Sonia Olson, uh, who is the lead uh, for the work group, will be presenting data on influenza A, H5N1 epidemiology and the vaccine, and then also present on the grade uh, and policy op op options for uh, H5N1 vaccine. Uh, we anticipate uh, having this uh, recommendation for potential vote in the February uh, 2015 ACIP meeting. So without further ado, I'll have Dr. Olson come on up. Thank you. As uh, John said, I'll be giving two talks. So this is the first on the background. Avian influenza H5N1 is a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus that causes highly transmissible severe respiratory disease in birds. The virus is endemic in poultry in at least six countries, Bangladesh, China, Egypt, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam, but it's also recently been found in Laos and Cambodia. Poultry outbreaks occur frequently in these countries, but also in neighboring countries. Infections have occurred in humans, the first of which were recognized in Hong Kong in 1997. At that time, there were 18 cases in humans, and Hong Kong culled the entire poultry population of approximately 1.5 million chickens. Um, the virus reemerged in Asia in 2003, and the number of cases have peaked around 2006. However, every year, including this year, there have been sporadic cases with high mortality. Between 2003 and September 2014, uh, there have been 667 cases in 16 countries. 393 of these uh, have died for a mortality of 59%. Most cases occur from close contact uh, with infected live or dead birds or H5N1 virus contaminated environments. Human to human transmission is extremely rare. This slide shows the number of cases of H5N1 infection in humans between 2004 and 2014. On the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is number of cases, and each color represents a case from a different country. So as I said, there have been 667 cases from 16 countries, 
And I'll just highlight uh, in 2004, these 20 cases here, nine were in Cambodia, four in Egypt, three in China, and two each in Vietnam and Indonesia. The H1, H5N1 virus continues to evolve, and the evolution is monitored using the sequence of the hemagglutinin gene. Viruses are then grouped into clades based on their phylogenetic characterization and sequence homology. And knowledge of what is currently circulating and the antigenic distance from existing candidate vaccine viruses is relevant to updating pre-pandemic vaccine recommendations. This slide shows H5 clades, uh, all of them from 1996 to 2014. Um, those with the red star are, have not been detected since uh, 2008, and there are 13 of those. Um, the clades highlighted in colors indicate the countries where the clades have been detected. And then the, the asterisks, oops, the asterisks here represent um, places where it has been actually reported recently in 2014. So just for example, like this purpley red color here, is clade 2.1.3, which occurs in Indonesia, and the star means that there have been cases occurring there this year. The next two slides, I'll highlight the global vaccine recommendations for H5N1. Uh, the WHO SAGE Working Group on Influenza Vaccines and Immunizations has developed global recommendations for use of licensed H5N1 vaccine during interpandemic periods. These recommendations were first drafted in 2009 and then reevaluated and essentially reaffirmed in 2013 with no changes. And the current recommendations are outlined here, um, and they are strongly recommended uh, vaccination of laboratory workers involved in certain high-risk groups, such as large-scale production or manipulation of, of the virus or work with drug-resistant viruses. Uh, the second group is just recommended. Those include first responders to human or animal uh, cases or outbreaks, or healthcare workers who evaluate or manage patients. And then not recommended includes persons who may only potentially come in contact with infected animals, essential workers who happen to be in, in areas where it's enzoonotic, or the general population. And these recommendations are not specific to any vaccine. Because H5 viruses continue to involve, this necessitates frequent development of representative candidate vaccine viruses. And WHO recommends that countries consider candidate vaccine viruses for pandemic preparedness based on their assessment of public health needs and risks. Uh, currently, globally, there are 26 vaccine virus candidates for H5M1 uh, in development and four in preparation. So now I'll just shift to talk about H5M1 vaccines in the United States. In the United States, H5N1 vaccines are not made commercially. The US government has supported their development. Candidate vaccine viruses are chosen for vaccine development here using a standardized influenza risk assessment tool. Currently, there are four vaccines in the stockpile, and this table shows those four vaccines. Uh, in, the, in the first column, it's, it's the virus that's in the vaccine, and the second, it's the clade represented, and the third is the licensure status. And you can see that these first two are licensed vaccines. Uh, vaccines in the stockpile are for use during a pandemic or for clinical studies of the vaccine, and strain changes, much like for seasonal flu, are permitted, but only during an emergency. These vaccines are not meant to be used during interpandemic times. So one of these vaccines, uh, called QPAN, is being produced post-licensure. The U.S. government is supporting this additional vaccine production, and the manufacturer is producing one lot of approximately 100,000 doses. It's uh, currently anticipated this vaccine will be ready, I think, in early 2015, uh, and it's set up so that a portion of this will be stored at NIH and made available to investigators, and the rest in the, will be in the stockpile. 
This vaccine, QPAN, is made by ID Biomedical Corporation of Quebec, which is a subsidiary of GSK. Uh, the vaccine is an emulsion, which um, consists of uh, the influenza virus strain A Indonesia 05 2005, uh, and it's 3.75 micrograms of the hemagglutinin, as well as an adjuvant, the ASO3 A, which just means it's the full dose of this adjuvant. So the vaccine is administered intramuscularly in two doses, 21 days apart. And the licensure states that it's approved for use in persons 18 years of older, 18 years of age or older, at increased risk of exposure to the influenza A virus H5M1 subtype contained in the vaccine. QPAN is the first vaccine with ASO3 to be licensed in the United States. There are no adjuvanted seasonal influenza vaccines licensed in the United States. Uh, it is an oil in water emulsion adjuvant. And there are several reasons to use uh, the adjuvant. Um, first uh, is increased immunogenicity. Uh, second is antigen dose sparing. In other words, you can use 3.75 micrograms instead of the regular 15 micrograms. And then um, influenza cross-strain neutralization or an ability to induce an immune response to other strains. ASO3 adjuvant was used in monovalent pandemic vaccines. Um, two, the two are listed here, Pandemrix made by GSK in Germany and Arapanrix made by ID Biomedical Corporation in Quebec. There have been reports of ASO3 adjuvant and pandemic vaccines associated with narcolepsy and several studies of pan uh, pandemics in um, European countries have found an increased risk of narcolepsy in all ages, though this is highest in children and adolescents. Um, there haven't been studies to date with negative findings, and the attributable risk in these uh, has been as high as six cases per 100,000 persons vaccinated. Um, in addition, there was recently a released uh, study uh, in Canada, or conducted in Canada and Brazil, with Aeropranrix. Uh, it was a population-based study, um, and it found a relative risk that was similar to those found in the European studies of Pandemrix. The attributable risk was lower at one case per million doses, um, but overall the, uh, the incidence of narcolepsy was also lower than was found in Europe. As I said, uh, adjuvanted monovalent pandemic vaccines were not used in the United States. Um, but because of uh, these findings, CDC has sponsored an international study on adjuvanted vaccines, both ASO3 and MS59, uh, and it's still in progress, and the results are expected in late 2015. So QPAN's license for adults at increased risk of exposure, but who is this group of people in the United States? So this table uh, defines those persons at increased risk. And I'll just walk you through the table. Um, so in the first column, we have occupational exposure group. The second column is uh, what this might include. It's not an exhaustive list. Third column is the work it might entail. And the fourth is the risk contemplated. So for example, laboratory workers, uh, that might include vaccine manufacturers, antiviral drug developers, you know, laboratory technicians who work with live virus or clinical samples of suspect from suspect cases, and the risks contemplated may include uh, mechanical malfunctions, human error, accidents, et cetera. So the groups um, that we've outlined at increased risk include laboratory workers, experimental animal study workers, which include veterinarians and animal care technicians, public health responders, uh, which might be um, CDC epidemiologists or, or other responders in the field, uh, public health responders from the animal health perspective, and then other which may include ancillary staff entering a laboratory with working on H5 virus. Given that persons at increased risk of exposure to H5N1 virus are fair, fairly narrowly defined, we wanted to estimate the size of the population and thus the possible vaccine demand. So this slide um, is an effort to do that, where we estimate the size of the population at increased risk of exposure. Um, so for lab workers, 
We know that in 2014, there are 173 principal investigators that have a USDA license to work with high path avian influenza viruses. Um, talking to the, to, to the three PIs at CDC, uh, we know that each of those has about 15 lab staff. So if you just multiply this out, we are estimating that in the United States, there's a total of about 3,000 people, uh, laboratory workers that might um, have interest in being vaccinated. And then public health responders, another group, um, we just tried to estimate numbers. But you can see that the total population we're talking about at increased risk of exposure is fairly low at about 3,000 persons and two doses for a vaccine, that's 6,000 doses of vaccine. We also wanted to quantify the risk of an exposure to H5N1 virus in these persons um, to begin to weigh sort of the risks and benefits. So in the United States, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses are regulated by USDA as select agents under the Code of Federal Regulations. And these select agent regulations require entities in the United States to, to do the following. To, uh, an individual or entity must immediately notify USDA or CDC upon discovery of a release of a select agent or toxin causing occupational exposure or release of a select agent or toxin outside the primary barriers of the biocontainment area. Uh, between 2007 and 2013, a review of these data showed that there were 44 reported incidents for an average of six per year. And the types of reports included things like needle sticks, animal bites, a leak, a work outside a containment facility, or some sort of equipment or personal protective equipment failure. Um, but I think it's important to to comment that an incident doesn't necessarily equate to an exposure. For an example, a needle stick injury with a solution that doesn't contain the virus could still be reported and included here. Um, so, you know, looking at these data and, and what we know about um, the number of laboratory workers, we estimated an annual frequency of incidents per laboratory worker of less than 1% per year. And none of these reported incidents resulted in infection. So in other words, no people got H5M1. So to summarize this uh, first uh, presentation um, of background, H5M1 remains a global concern and it has high mortality. In the United States, there are two licensed vaccines, one of which is being made post-licensure. The total population at increased risk of occupational exposure is small. Um, the data that we have suggests that the risk of transmission through occupational exposure is uh, zero to extremely low. Um, there are some limitations. Laboratory events certainly could have gone unreported, which would have underestimated the number of incidents. Um, in addition, that reporting is not restricted to H5M1, it's to all high, highly pathogenic avian influenza viruses. Um, so that could have overestimated it. And we don't have any systematic data collection on public health responders, but we do know that there haven't been any um, infections in those uh, in public health responders from the United States. Um, so I'd like to thank just a few people for help uh, putting together these data. Um, and I think I'll just pause here before we go on to the next set. Dr. Harrison, a point of clarification or a question? Yeah, I, I was just unclear about the issue of the adjuvanted vaccines and whether, and the issue of narcolepsy, and whether you were implying that it's a, is it a vaccine specific issue, an antigen specific issue, or is it a adjuvant specific issue? Well, I think we don't, we don't know what the issue is. Um, I don't know if any, anybody from immunization safety wants to address that question. <coughs> Dr. Shimagura. Tom Shema Bakuro, Immunization Safety Office. So the the um, the findings have really been observed in in pandemics. The monovalent H1N1 vaccine um, that was widely used in Europe, and then the the one study that 
um, Dr. Olson mentioned uh, in, in Quebec. And there's additional work going on looking at, uh, at, at C the CDC-sponsored uh, study looking at both uh, ASO3 adjuvanted vaccines and MF59 adjuvanted vaccines. That's in progress and we should have preliminary results later in 2015. And Dr. Reingold. I, I may have missed this, but it seems to me in terms of the recommendations, how one might use the vaccine, it would be important for us to know something about whether this is in bulk, whether it's filled and finished, and what the shelf life and, and what the commitment is to continuing to have stockpiles uh, of the vaccine is. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, right now, everything's kept in bulk at the manufacturer, separated antigen and adjuvant. Um, I think there's... I think there's still some, in terms of the su supplying this, I think there's some things that need to be worked out, but I, but I will say that there's already a precedent for, for this, uh, in, if by uh, some of the clinical trials that have, uh, the vaccine has gone to NIH and, um, they have prepared the vaccine there and, uh, distributed it from NIH. And as I understand, there's a mechanism in place uh, through NIH for some of the delivery, but I, I think some of the delivery issues would still need to be worked out. Uh, Dr. Sorry, just to clarify, and maybe Bruce can comment on this, but I'm just not clear what the commitment is to continuing to have uh, viable vaccines, what the shelf life is, whether it'll be replaced if it meets the end of its shelf life, things like that. So, so as Sonia mentioned, the, the viable vaccine piece, so the way that the pandemic stock, vaccine stockpile is managed is, is in bulk, um, so that formulation can occur at the right quantities when that needs to happen. Uh, that is the plan going forward, and there's no end point to that right now. You heard that there are a number of um, clades in that stockpile now that are, that are handled in that same way. I, I think... I think if I recall correctly that uh, they had said that it's approximately like a 12-month shelf life, but that they reevaluate this, and so it can be extended. So, so when it's in bulk, it doesn't have a shelf life. It doesn't? It, it doesn't have it, a shelf life. It's, it can be, so it's, it's, a, it's antigen that can be, can be then formulated based on the content that's needed afterwards. So once it's in a vial, and maybe Wellington may want to comment, but once in a vial, then the, the clock starts. But uh, what's in there is, is evaluated for stability over time. Dr. Ernstein? Given the number of cl clades, and we're talking about one clade now, are there any data on either in animal studies of cross protection or antibody uh, against the different clades? So would uh, this vaccine, for example, induce antibody against yeah. the other clades as well as the, uh, its own clade? Yeah, in the, in the next presentation, I'll present some data, uh, and actually the, the data on the heterologous immunity is in the extra slides that I won't be presenting, but there are some, some data. It's, I mean, I can tell you, it's a, there, yes, there is a response. It's, it's a diminished response, um, but if you look in the extra slides, you can see some of those data. Uh, Dr. Bologna. And it depends, sorry, it just depends which, you know, which virus you're looking at. I'm uh, just curious about the estimate of 2,600 um, lab workers, you know, potentially, and sort of, um, I wasn't clear if those, there are 2,600 uh, people who are routinely on a daily basis sort of handling this pathogen, or there's people who might occasionally be exposed, or what's, what's the estimate as far as the level of exposure these, these people have? Yeah, that's a good question. We're, we're trying to look into that a little bit more. Um, these were sort of rough calculations um, based on people that at some point would have, I mean, and, and we just looked at the, the three, uh, what we know about the PIs at, at CDC. So we haven't gone out and, and surveyed everyone or anything. Um, I think there is a, there is a, a variability in terms of, you know, how much somebody works in a laboratory and we, we don't have that information at, at this point. So this is just a rough calculation. Okay, uh, I think we can probably move along to the uh, discussion on the uh, uh, grading of the evidence. Thank you.
Okay, so just to restate the policy question, should licensed influenza A, H5N1 vaccine be recommended to adults with increased risk of exposure during the interpandemic time? And the first thing that the work group did was to define the outcomes of interest. So first we enumerated all the possible outcomes of interest independent of whether there, we thought there were data available or not. Uh, and then each member scored the outcomes using a numeric score with the highest numbers uh, associated with uh, outcomes that were critical decision-making, lower that were important or not important. Uh, and then we summarize these rankings. So these are first the safety outcomes. Um, and you see here we have six critical outcomes, any vaccine-related serious adverse event, anaphylaxis or immediate hypersensitivity, narcolepsy, Guillain-Barre syndrome, or other ne serious neurologic outcomes, mortality. And then Important were general symptoms or, and syncope and fever. And then low, which we don't address again as per the, the grade format, was injection site reactions. These are the immunogenicity outcomes. Um, and I'll just, this is a little complicated, so I'll just walk you through it. So there were, in terms of the time period, there was uh, tw 21 days post second vaccina vaccination or six months post second vaccination. Then there were the homologous and heterologous outcomes, which, as we just sort of mentioned, the homologous are uh, immunogenicity events to the same virus that's in the vaccine, uh, and heterologous are uh, immune responses to a different virus. And we looked at seroprotection, which is just a, a single antibody positivity or seroconversion, um, and these are both defined using FDA uh, standard criteria that they use for licensure for H5M1 vaccines. Um, so the top two were the two outcomes the group thought were critical, the homologous um, out immunogenicity outcomes at uh, three weeks post-second vaccine, and the others were all considered important. Okay, so the next step was to define what data we could review, and to do this, I think it's helpful to understand a little bit about what vaccines there are. These are the GSK H5N1 vaccines. Uh, they are adjuvanted vaccines, but they are manufactured in two different places, and this is relevant because the manufacturing process differs between the two plants. So there's the one in Quebec, which is called sometimes Pumarix and sometimes Cupan, which we're using here, uh, and then the one in Dresden, which is called Prepandrix or Dpan, the, the Q for Quebec, the D for Dresden. Um, and then you can insert what, what virus you want into that vaccine, and so the ones coming out of Dresden have had both the Vietnam and Indonesia, and uh, in Quebec, it's the Indonesia. So this is what we're talking about here, this vaccine that's FDA licensed. However, in addition, GSK makes a bunch of seasonal influenza vaccines and has made pandemic influenza vaccines. So there's three uh, seasonal ones here, two of the pandemic ones here. Um, the seasonal vaccines are all unadjuvanted with uh, 15 micrograms of the hemagglutinin in the pandemics. Uh, pa uh, pandemic vaccines are both adjuvanted with the lower antigen dose, and you can see that they're made in a variety of uh, the two different plants in Quebec and Dresden. So the question is what data to use, and um, we decided that uh, considering um, that, that, that it would be difficult to extrapolate data from some of these other vaccines for several reasons. One is that you have this different manufacturing process and we don't know what that means in terms of interpreting results. The antigen content would differ uh, as well as the presence or absence of an adjuvant. Um, in addition, uh, avian influenza viruses um, are known to be less immunogenetic than uh, than human seasonal influenza viruses. Um, so that was the other reason. So for those reasons, we chose to focus on the vaccine that was specific uh, to, well, the QPAN vaccine that was manufactured in Quebec. So as part of our literature review, we searched uh, you know, with key terms H5N1 vaccine and Indonesia. We had a few additional references that were provided by the manufacturer. Um, we reviewed the, several of us reviewed independently the abstracts from all of these and then did full article reviews on 20 papers. A number, 16 papers were excluded because either the, the primary vaccine strain was different um, or was made in the wrong plant. Um, 
and we ended up with four studies that we looked at in detail. So this slide walks you through the four studies. I'll just show, tell you that in, in red is what is the QPAN by definition of the, the licensure criteria. So the full dose of the adjuvant, adjuvant administered at day zero and 21. So the first study was a randomized uh, control trial with no placebo. Its question was basically looking at different adjuvant doses, full versus half, and different manufacturing sites, Quebec versus Dresden. The second is a randomized control trial that did have a placebo. Um, the third is a randomized uh, trial with no placebo that was comparing different dosing schedules. And then the last is really just a descriptive study with no comparison group. And the, you can see that they've only looked at safety and immunogenicity. So we re reviewed the data from all four of these papers. And like I said, each one has a different question. Um, so it makes it a little bit confusing. Uh, but the one study that was designed to answer our question, which is, you know, vaccine yes or no, was the placebo-controlled one. So this is the study that we've gone on to grade the evidence, and I will present. However, in case you're interested, um, uh, the data from all four studies are presented in your extra slides, but I'm not, I'm not going to go through those. So the outcomes, this slide shows the outcomes that were available from this one placebo-controlled trial. You can see that we're missing several of the critical uh, safety outcomes. Um, and we have data on only the homologous um, immunologic outcomes. OK, so I'm going to walk you through the grade results. I think the committee is familiar with these, but I'll go through the first slide in more detail just to orient you to the tables. And then they're the same on, on each slide. So we're starting with the two safety outcomes that are critical. These are any vaccine-related SAE and mortality. We, in the first column, is the study design. So all of these will be randomized control trial with one study. And then there's these um, four um, biases that we rate either not serious, serious, or very serious. And when they're downgraded, for example, here, serious, we put the reason why here. So for any vaccine-related serious adverse event, we downgraded imprecision on this one because the sample size is too small to detect rare uh, adverse events. Uh, and then here you have the relative risk and the risk difference. So this is QPAN versus the placebo. And then the quality of the evidence, which is determined based on these um, downgradings. So, and, and here are the actual data. So if you want to see the number of events, in this case there were zero in both groups, so we couldn't estimate these data. Um, but the, and then the quality of evidence was ra rated moderate because we downgraded here. So for mortality, you can see that there were actually fewer deaths in the QPAN vaccinated group than the placebo group. So it's a re reduced uh, relative risk um, with five fewer deaths per 1,000 uh, with a quality of evidence of high. So each slide will be similar, and I'll just go through them uh, fairly fast. So these are the safety outcomes that were listed as important. Fatigue, headache, joint pain. There's three slides of these important safety outcomes. Um, in this case, um, all of these, the, the QPAN vaccinated group had a, a slightly elevated uh, risk for these safety outcomes. Uh, and for each of these, we felt that the data, data uh, were good and that the quality of evidence was high. This slide goes on to show muscle aches, shivering, and sweating. Um, for muscle aches and shivering, you can see again, it was uh, in a significantly increased uh, risk. Um, but we felt that the, and we also felt that the, the quality of the evidence was high. For sweating, we actually downgraded it because it was a, um, a confidence interval that included one. So essentially, there was no difference found here between these two groups. Um, uh, and considered the evidence as moderate. And then the last of the important safety outcomes, syncope and fever. Uh, we downgraded syncope for very serious, I think I forgot the, the bullet, but it's because of um, the, the inability to detect rare events uh, with a, a relative risk of one, and we downgraded 
because we downgraded the evidence, the quality was ranked as low. And then for fever, um, no difference between the groups. You can see here the frequency of fever uh, and the evidence was rated as moderate. Okay, so moving on to the immunologic outcomes, and this is just a reminder that these are beneficial outcomes, so you want to see an elevated relative risk in your vaccinated group. So these are the two critical outcomes, the 21-day homologous um, seroprotection and seroconversion. Um, with both of these, um, we didn't have any um, concerns about the quality of the data. Uh, you can see the elevated relative risk here and the actual frequency of um, seroprotection or seroconversion you can see here in the QPAN group versus the placebo. So we, we rated these both as quality of evidence as high. And then the uh, immunogenicity outcomes um, that were ranked as important, these are just the same two, but at the six month time point. Um, these are, were a subset of the original sample sizes. So we've downgraded because it's, it's essentially because we have a smaller sample size here. Um, we get a wide confidence interval. And you can see in the QPAN group here and here that at six months you have a diminished immune response by both measures, zero protection, zero conversion. Um, so overall, the quality of evidence we rated is moderate. So the next two tables just summarize these data so you can see them all together. Um, again, this is the, the safety, the harms, uh, comparison of QPAM versus placebo. Um, of the six critical outcomes, we only had data on two. Um, overall, the evidence uh, type is rated based on the, um, it's based on the critical outcomes for which you have data. So you look at, at these two and, sorry, that should be a two. Um, so the overall evidence type is two of, as moderate. But you can see that we're missing data on all these outcomes. And then here you can see the important ones and just the summary of how they were ranked. Similarly, this is the evidence table for the benefits. Um, we're missing any of the heterologous outcomes. We see that we have an increased response to the vaccine for uh, both the two critical and two important outcomes. Um, overall, because both of these were ranked as high evidence type, overall we say that uh, the quality of evidence was high. So in addition to these grade data, there are some additional considerations for formulating any recommendations. Um, and so the first is to consider the balance between the benefits and the harms. And I've listed some points here that the, the work group uh, considered. Um, that these, we, we based um, all of this on a single study. Um, the benefits may not be generalizable, as was mentioned before, because of clade evolution, and this is just one virus in the vaccine. We're missing data on four of our six critical harms. Uh, there's no data on efficacy, it's not possible. Um, and we know that there's a low exposure risk and a, a low or zero transmission risk. So these are things to just that the work group weighed. Um, overall, the evidence type was moderate for safety and high for immunogenicity. In terms of values and preferences, it was difficult. We don't really have data on how the target group values this outcome, um, but we do know that the target group is uh, a few people. It's probably an estimate of less than 3,000 people in the United States. And then usually these, um, these uh, analyses take into account um, health economic data, um, which isn't really relevant here because the US government's paying for this vaccine, so it wasn't considered. So this is the, the last slide. Um, this is what the work group uh, puts forward for consideration. It's just for discussion today. Um, but a category B, I'm sorry, and th this should be actually eight, 18 or older. There should be a line under here. Um, so the group recommends a category B recommendation um, at adults 18 years or older with an increased risk of occupational exposure during the interpandemic period 
may receive adjuvanted influenza A H5N1 vaccine for protection against in infection with influenza A H5N1. The intervention being QPAN, two doses administered 21 days apart, and the occupational exposure defined uh, as follows, laboratory workers who have contact or work with live virus or clinical samples from suspected cases, experimental animal study workers who have contact with or care for uh, virus inoculated or infected animals, secretions or products, public health responders investigating or managing suspected or confirmed cases, public health responders investigating suspected or confirmed avian cases of influenza A H5N1, H5N1 infection, or others who work in locations where exposure to influenza A H5N1 virus could occur. Okay, open it up for your questions. Uh, Dr. Kemp. So could you clarify when the additional safety data will be available and whether it will contain all the critical elements that we lack right now? It, that we don't anticipate any more data being available. There will be data from the CDC-sponsored narcolepsy study, which is not specific to this vaccine, and that'll be ready in 2015. But, you know, there's not enough, to get to see most of those very rare outcomes, you have to vaccinate a lot of people, and that's not, it's not going to happen, so we don't anticipate any more data. So can you clarify what the additional data will, um, that CDC is going to be getting about the adjuvant? Oh, specifically with respect to the, ad, the ASO3 data? Um, or, I mean, there's no I guess other I, data. I don't understand what the additional data that oh. was discussed that the CDC is collecting regarding safety is about. Okay, so I'll let Tom speak. I, I think that Essentially, there are no other data specific to this vaccine that we will get, that we anticipate at any point. Um, there will be additional data from the CDC-sponsored study looking at uh, vaccines from the pandemic that were adjuvanted with the same adjuvant, um, and those are expected in 2015. But there won't be any more data with specifically on H5N1 vaccine. Tom, do you want to comment? Tom Chimba Bakuro from the Immunization Safety Office. So this, the CDC-sponsored study on, on narcolepsy is looking at a 2009 monovalent H1N1 adjuvanted vaccine, uh, both ASO3 and MF59 adjuvanted vaccine. So that's going back and looking at, um, at other at countries outside of Europe that, that used adjuvanted vaccines, and that data will be available um, probably towards the end of 2015. But um, as Sonia said, that's not that that that's not the vaccine that 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 she's discussing. That's pandemic adjuvanted pandemic vaccine. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rubin. Uh, yes, two clarifications, please. One is in the main trial, did the placebo um, recipients did they receive the adjuvant as part of that placebo? Uh, and also, is this a purified hemagglutinin vaccine or is this a split vaccine with the amount of hemagglutinin that you indicated? Um, I, I can't remember what was in the placebo. Um, and perhaps the manufacturer wants to comment on that. Um, it's a, do you, do you want to comment on that? Yes, Leonard Friedman from GSK. It, uh, the placebo arm did not receive a vaccine that had any adjuvant. It was a placebo arm. And this is a split inactivated subvirin vaccine similar to the seasonal vaccines that are used. In this case, it's for the H5N1. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dr. Rungold. Yeah, yeah, hi. Um, uh, if I understand correctly, in the February meeting, we're going to be asked to vote uh, on, on this. Did I understand that correctly in terms of a recommendation for use of, of, of the vaccine? Is that correct? Yes. So I'm just curious if, if these are the draft recommendations. I'm sure you know that SAGE for WHO went through a lengthy similar process in terms of pandemic flu vaccine, and I was on that working group, and I always found this a very difficult discussion. But one of the things discussed was storage of the vaccine in humans, that is to say priming large numbers of individuals with the first dose so that if there was a pandemic, you'd only have to give one additional dose to those individuals to then achieve protection as opposed to having to uh, dispose of large quantities of vaccine when it reached its, the end of its shelf life. And I'm just curious, 
uh, whether any, and there was also discussion about potentially other populations whom, who we might want to protect in the event of a pandemic, uh, frontline, not, not just this very limited group, but a much larger group of individuals. So I'm just curious, it sounds like as a policy, you guys have already pretty much focused uh, on, on this group, and I'm just curious if there was a wider discussion about potential use of the, of the vaccine um, and, and whether we'll be having any of that discussion or, or, or not? It was only tangentially discussed because we were pretty focused on this question and so didn't want to get sidetracked. I think, um, it, you know, it, it may be additional question for the group, but it wasn't thoroughly discussed. And, and as you know, I think that ultimately the SAGE recommendation said, at least at that time, there wasn't enough data to recommend priming. Uh, Dr. Bologna. So this is sort of coming back to my previous question, uh, given that this is likely to come up as a recommendation, is a, there's a spectrum of potential exposures among people who fall in these categories, some people who have you know, rare occasional exposure to samples or people who have repeated um, or daily frequent exposure. And I, I think it, given the, um, the uncertainties and the limited amount of data that's available right now regarding safety and um, it would be helpful to maybe clarify on this that you're looking at people who have repeated or frequent exposures or potential exposures rather than people who have, you know, rare or uncommon exposures. That was something that the work group discussed, and it was decided that, I mean, there, there aren't any data to look at, you know, frequency of exposure, and there are no transmission events, so it's hard to put data around that. And, and the WHO recommendations do talk about you know, work with large amounts of virus or extended period of time, but they don't quantify any of that. And so our group decided that it was just too nebulous and it would be clearer to just, you know, to say that you work with it or you don't work with it. But it, I think it's something the work group can discuss again and consider. Dr. Sun. I, I want to go back to Dr. Kenke, Kenke's question about the size of the safety database. And I just wanted to make sure that, uh, that we're, uh, uh, and make known the, when, our, when we approve QPAN H5, um, as all vaccines that FDA approves, uh, the manufacturer is required to evaluate the vaccine uh, uh, in children. And so there, there are requirements for additional studies and, and uh, maybe the company can comment on what additional safety data are, are, are available from, from those requirements. Thank you. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Uh, Weber. Yes, uh, uh, just uh, if you could clarify a little bit more about what you mean by public health responders. We have one uh, colleague on my campus who works with uh, emerging viral diseases, including SARS, MERS, and 1918 flu. I don't know if he works with H5N1, but let's assume he did. Our policy, of course, is if uh, one of those workers becomes ill, they'll come to our hospital emergency department, be evaluated, and possibly admitted. Uh, would that include our 300 members in our emergency department uh, care team to take care of him, our occupational health department? I'm not quite sure if you could sort of sure. focus on that, what you mean by public health responders. Sure. What, what this group uh, includes are people who are... U.S. people who go to a place to investigate. So if you're going to Indonesia to investigate a cluster of illness in humans or a poultry die-off that is H5N1, those are the type of people we're talking about. We're not talking about, because there are no cases in the United States, uh, we're not talking about healthcare workers or first responders in the United States. We're only talking about those who might go to a situation. But we understand, of course, this is a fluid situation and and that in the future could change. Thank you. I have Dr. Ornstein, Dr. Bennett, Dr. Schaffner, and Ms. Pellegrini, and Dr. Lair. So, uh, Dr. Ornstein. I just wanted to clarify one thing. I was intrigued by the five-fold reduction in mortality in the vaccinated group that was statistically significant. I presume you think that's a statistical artifact of multiple things. Is there any biologic plausibility uh, to that? Uh, and the second is a number of us may be involved in research studies doing surveillance for influenza in, in various animal populations, both domestically 
and abroad. My presumption is though, unless it's specifically in a high risk H5N1, those people would not fit into the uh, risk category for getting the vaccine. Is that correct? Right. For the second answer, that's correct. Um, sorry, what was the first one again? The, the first one is, as I read your data, you've got a five-fold reduction in mortality in oh, yeah, the vaccinated yeah. group that is statistically yes, yes. significant. So these are, these are not vaccine-associated deaths. I mean, these are just mortality that happened in the study. Most of these are, are older persons. Um, so, I mean, we can't s say for sure that it's a statistical fluke, but, you know, it's, I, I, it didn't raise any concerns in the, in the work group. The opposite is actually we'd be recommending it for a lot more people. <laughs> the question is, is, is there a causal role? Right. Dr. Bennett? Uh, this is just a follow-on to the questions that were previously asked about public health responders. And I just want to point out that not that long ago, um, we vaccinated a lot of people in this country against smallpox. And the wording was very similar. And I don't think you intend that, but it may be useful to more uh, uh, deeply describe what you mean by public health responders. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for uh, misinterpreting that the way it's written. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Schaffner. Yeah, thank you. Thinking about these public health responders that may go out to several outbreaks and laboratorians that have frequent and repeated exposures to these viruses, I'm concerned or interested in the du anticipated duration of immunity. Mm. And are you thinking about a one-time immunization or people who have frequent and repeated exposures over time, will they be re-immunized? Yeah. I think that's a good question, and it's not, it's not one the group addressed. Um, you know, we did look at intentionally at the six-month immunogenicity outcomes, um, and we see that the immune response is diminished. Um, we don't have longer outcomes to look at, so we don't really have data to assess that. Um, so we, didn't, we haven't addressed it. Uh, uh, Ms. Pellegrini. Uh, Dr. Sun noted that as, as part of the FDA approval process, more studies were expected to be conducted in children. And if I'm not mistaken, I, I think the company representative may have been prepared to address that. Um, could, could we hear more about that for a moment? Yes, uh, Leonard Friedland from GSK. A pediatric study in infants down to six months of age all the way up to that uh, 17 years of age has been conducted. The uh, company has shared the information recently with the FDA and discussions are in place to amend the BLA in the future to include a license indication down below the current age of 18. Okay, uh, Dr. Lehrer. One comment and one question. Um, the comment when you said that the health economic analysis is not relevant as it's paid for by the U.S. government, I would disagree with that. Um, if the cost of a vaccine was a million dollars a dose or ten dollars a dose, that does come down to relevance for me at least. Um, the other question is the groups you have here, if we don't have any evidence of laboratory transmission, I mean we only have 46 exposures, um, do laboratory workers need this? Do we have a case in the world where a laboratory worker has gotten this disease? If it's never been done, do we need to be protecting them or is there some theoretical risk? Are animal study workers more at risk because they're handling infected animals than laboratory workers? Those kinds of things haven't been teased out. Thank you. Um, I think the work group can go back and discuss the co cost effectiveness. I appreciate what you're saying there. Um, you're correct. I mean, there there are no uh, there are no cases uh, known cases of transmission in either a public health responder or a laboratory worker, and I think that's what contributed to the recommendation of a category B as opposed to A. But um, certainly something the group could discuss further. Following up on that, I don't remember any discussion, but uh, do you know if with the laboratory breaches, if there's just routine administration of antiviral in those situations, or is, is there any report of that? 
you know, I, I can't speak for, for all of them, but I think in general they, they, there's a discussion that goes on when these events happen and it's recommended. I don't know how many have taken antivirals. I do know that uh, at least recent ones I've heard about, yes, that, that does happen. And Dr. Harrison. So people look to ACIP for guidance, and as I read this, this does not really appear to provide much guidance. It just says, may receive, and I'm not sure exactly what that means. Has there been consideration in the working group to making a clear document in terms of what we're actually recommending? If I can respond, uh, we have the option of the category A recommendations, which uh, use language uh, such as should receive. Uh, in this one, this was an area of a lot of deliberation uh, with the work group and felt that category B was appropriate uh, for individual clinical decision making uh, based on one's own uh, exposure, one's own uh, concern about that exposure and coming down with this, uh, and, and plus all the unknowns in terms of the the uh, both both the risks and long-term benefits. So we felt this squarely came down in the category B. Uh, suffice to say that uh, we, as ASIP, uh, disdain you know the category B recommendations. We felt that this one was actually appropriate here. Uh, Dr. Kemp. So just following up on that, I mean, the the key here is going to be the risk benefit information given to people. I mean, it, th this in itself just allows people to get it, but the, the key uh, will be getting the risks and benefits down to some kind of a reasonable one-pager. And uh, I, I think we're, we're going to live with a, a great deal of unknowns here, so... Uh, but we, we appreciate the, uh, speaking for Dr. Campos Outcall, uh, appreciate kind of the depth of discussion here because that's all information that can go back to the work group for further discussion and, and modification uh, prior to February. So uh, are there any other comments or questions? And if not, uh, we will move along uh, to the uh, protesters discussion and Dr. Reingold, if you can come up to the podium. Thanks, John. Um, so we stand between you and lunch. Um, so we'll try and keep this uh, brief um, and keep, get us uh, back on time. But it is an important topic, and uh, it's one that the, the committee certainly will need to uh, come back to. The, um, so first, uh, to acknowledge the work of the working group uh, members, and I, uh, it was mentioned that Kathy Harriman couldn't be here today, but it wasn't mentioned why. Uh, Kathy is working on Ebola in West Africa, and I hope she has the wisdom to return through California uh, rather than <laughs> other possible airports. Um, we may see her sooner in that event. Uh, but I particularly want to acknowledge the work of Jennifer Liang, who will be giving the, the, the presentation after me, because Jennifer really is the person who does the heavy lifting uh, for the work group. Um, so this is simply to remind you of the terms of reference for the Pertussis Working Group, uh, which I joined after uh, it was well advanced in, it, in its work. Uh, as many, as you all know, there are a number of uh, ACIP statements about the use of uh, Pertussis vaccines. Uh, four of them, at, in fact, at the moment, and the working group is charged with consolidating them into a single statement. Uh, in addition, reviewing new data on Tdap uh, in a variety of contexts, uh, and particularly uh, use of Tdap for revaccination, uh, multiple doses of Tdap, and then uh, lastly to review and update the epidemiology of tetanus and diphtheria in the United States. Uh, to simply remind you that there are two Tdap products uh, licensed in the United States. They're both licensed for single use, Boostrix and Adacel. <clears throat> uh, and that the current ACIP recommendations for Tdap and, and TD are for a single Tdap dose for all persons ages uh, 11 and older, uh, preferably given at age 11 or 12. Pregnant women are recommended to receive a dose of Tdap with every pregnancy, uh, and this is obviously primarily designed to provide passive protection uh, to the newborn baby. Uh, and then in addition, a decennial TD booster for those who've received a dose of, of Tdap. <clears throat> so uh, these are some data about coverage. 
uh, with uh, DTAP and, and TDAP, um, and I think as everyone knows, we achieve high levels of coverage uh, with uh, infant immunization. Um, we do generally fairly well uh, with the adolescent dose of, of Tdap, uh, but uh, we're not doing very well in terms of coverage of adults with uh, Tdap. The green line on the bottom shows we're not doing very well with this recommendation. Uh, and pregnant women at the moment, my understanding uh, from Jennifer is around 15% of pregnant women are receiving a dose of Tdap, so we obviously are not doing well uh, at the moment with achieving coverage in that group uh, either. Um, obviously, because we're giving vaccine to pregnant women, that raises safety concerns, and this is something that the, um, uh, the uh, safety office has been fo following uh, for quite some time. Um, these are uh, basically the data since the uh, update in, in, in February. Uh, there have been a number of reports to VAERS, uh, but I think if you were to look at these, you'd see that there's no particular pattern. I know that I think Pedro or someone is here from the safety office who can comment uh, more on this. Uh, but basically, as I see it, there are no signals here concerning uh, adverse uh, events uh, in context of giving the vaccine to pregnant women. But we can certainly talk more about that. Uh, in addition, there are other uh, activities going on to monitor safety in the context of, of uh, the maternal Tdap recommendation. So in addition to the VARES system, uh, the uh, VSD uh, is uh, involved in continuing analysis of, of data, um, and the CISA project also uh, is doing a study of safety in pregnant women. Uh, I think the working group has also asked uh, to see whether or not there might be other sources of data potentially within the military or other groups that might have a large experience with use of the vaccine in pregnancy, and we're trying to maintain uh, as much uh, awareness of what's happening in pregnancy as possible. Um, now, in June of 2013, which was before I uh, joined uh, the group, uh, uh, this was presented to the ACIP. Uh, there was a recognition of an increasing burden of pertussis. You all are aware of the fact that we have a substantial burden of pertussis uh, nationally. Uh, pretty good evidence that the second dose of Tdap is safe and immunogenic. Uh, very good evidence that uh, protection wanes after a number of years, clinical protection uh, does wane. Um, but in fact, at least one model uh, that has not yet been published, but a model that showed that a second dose of Tdap uh, would really have only a very, very limited effect in terms of reducing disease burden. And this is just one graph taken from that. It's, this is yet unpublished, although there is a manuscript. Uh, and what it basically shows is that while one dose of Tdap uh, and, uh, and at 11 or 12 years of age has a substantial impact on the number of pertussis cases, that adding a second dose uh, either at the 16 years of age or 21 years of age those are the, uh, the, the uh, basically you can see that the three bottom lines are virtually superimposable and that there in fact would be very limited benefit to adding additional boosters uh, after the uh, booster at um, the dose at 11. Um, uh, so at least at the June uh, 2013 meeting, uh, it was considered that uh, a, a second dose of Tdap would have limited public health impact. Uh, no change was recommended in terms of the recommendation uh, except to focus on preventing pertussis in infants by making sure that pregnant women receive a dose in every pregnancy, um, but that in addition there was clearly a need to continue to look at the issue of, of, uh, of use of the vaccine, both in healthcare workers, in the context of outbreaks in particular, uh, and perhaps among close contacts of infants. So uh, in today's session, Jennifer is going to present uh, some information uh, around uh, Tdap vaccine, about the issue of pertussis in healthcare personnel, about the potential impact of vaccinating healthcare personnel, and where the working group is at the moment uh, with regard to its uh, considerations of these issues. So let me turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. Um, thank you. So as Dr. Reingold noted, ACIP made considerations over a year ago for a second dose of Tdap for the general population, but did not make changes to the current recommendation. So since then, the work group has considered Tdap vaccination of healthcare personnel and evaluated the need for 
the need for and potential impact of additional doses of Tdap. For today's discussion, I will present a summary of these data and the workgroup's conclusions. Currently, both Tdap vaccines are licensed only for a single dose, and as previously reviewed by ACIP, a single dose of Tdap is safe and immunogenic. There are several published clinical trials from other countries on a second dose of Tdap at five or 10 years after the first dose. Reported adverse events were generally comparable to those after the first Tdap. The majority of local and systemic adverse events were mild to moderate and self-limited. Of few serious adverse events reported, none were determined to be related to the receipt of the second Tdap. Safety profiles were comparable at the five and 10 year interval. For immunogenicity, after receipt of a second Tdap, tetanus and diphtheria are essentially 100% protected. For the pertussis components, responses are similar at five and 10 year intervals, and responses are also comparable to historic and contemporaneous first dose. After a single dose of Boostrix, similar geometric mean concentration curves are observed through 10 years for the three pertussis antigens. Response to a second Boostrix after a 10-year interval is also shown. Response to the second dose was similar to the, first, to the response after the first at a 10-year interval. And although not shown, a second dose of Adacel at a 10-year interval also showed similar response after a first dose. For Adacel, after a five-year interval, response to a second Tdap was robust, but was lower compared to the response after the first dose. But at five years, please note the baseline for pertussis antibodies before a second Tdap were higher. In the United States, both pharmaceutical companies are conducting clinical trials of a second dose of Tdap. Sanofi Pasteur's U.S. study for Adacel is complete and was presented to the work group and summarized to ACIP in February 2013. A revaccination study in Canada will finish later this year, and Sanofi plans to submit to FDA considerations of label updates for Adacel. GSK's revaccination program for Boostrix is also underway. One revaccination study of young adults who received their first Tdap as adolescents 10 years earlier is complete. And a revaccination study in adults is underway. GSK plans to submit data to FDA for consideration of label updates to Boostrix, which will be dependent on pertussis, the pertussis epidemiology and ACIP recommendations. Tdap is effective, but protection starts to wane within three years. Previous estimates of Tdap vaccine effectiveness range between 66% to 78%. However, all of these studies involved adolescents who received some whole cell vaccines as part of their childhood series. At the time, the effectiveness of Tdap among adolescents who had received all acellular vaccines in childhood was unknown. During the 2012 epidemic in Washington, the CDC, in collaboration with Washington State Health Department of Health, conducted a large-scale vaccine effectiveness study in adolescents who only received acellular pertussis vaccines. Estimated Tdap vaccine effectiveness was 65%, 65%, which is consistent with previous studies. This study also looked at the duration of protection. In 2012, Wisconsin also evaluated Tdap vaccine effectiveness and duration of protection in their adolescent population that also only received acellular vaccines. Despite the methodologies being different, both studies demonstrated substantial waning of protection over time. In Washington, the initial effectiveness within 12 months of Tdap vaccination was 73%. Following this, the effectiveness declined substantially. Between two and four years post-vaccination, vaccine effectiveness was only 34%. This waning in protection is consistent with the observed epidemiology. Wisconsin published results that were very similar to CDC's findings. Tdap vaccine effectiveness decreased with increasing time since receipt. For indirect protection, it is unclear what the effect of Tdap vaccination is on preventing pertussis transmission. 
For people vaccinated with acellular pertussis vaccines, symptoms are not as severe and presumably less likely to transmit. An Australian cocooning case control study found a modest decrease in the risk of pertussis in infants whose mothers were vaccinated at a sufficient time to boost their immune response relative to the infant's pertussis incubation period. This effect was also seen in infants whose mothers were vaccinated postpartum. But it's unclear whether the lower risk of infants was attributable to a short-term impact on transmission for recently vaccinated mothers or the lack of exposure to infants. An animal model showed that acellular pertussis vaccinated baboons were protected against disease, but not infection. Bacterial colony counts from a nasal pharyngeal washes were comparable to those observed in unvaccinated animals. Infected but asymptomatic baboons transmitted pertussis to other co-housed baboons. Although these results are striking, it is unclear if this animal model represents what happens with humans, vaccines, and infection. There is currently no human challenge model. Pertussis occurs in healthcare personnel, but probably is not, significant, not a significant contribution to the overall burden of disease. Occupational exposures to pertussis occurs in healthcare settings. The frequency and proximity of patient interaction puts healthcare personnel at increased risk for infection with potential to expose many. Nosocomial infections in healthcare settings have been documented. The index case has been identified as a healthcare personnel, patient, or hospital visitor. There have been numerous published reports of pertussis outbreaks in a variety of healthcare settings. Anecdotally, states recently hard hit with pertussis have not identified or reported healthcare outbreaks, including California, Wisconsin, and Washington. The last one reported to CDC was in 2011. The measured risk and burden of disease in healthcare personnel are not well defined. National surveillance does not collect healthcare personnel status for pertussis cases. There are a few population based estimates on the relative risk of pertussis for healthcare personnel. One study in the province of Quebec estimated a 1.7 fold increased risk for healthcare personnel compared to their adult population. This was based on 384 reported adult pertussis cases, 32 which were healthcare personnel. Another study found 1.3 to 3.6 percent annual incidence in emergency department residents, nursing and patient emergency department residents, nursing and patient care staff. Incidence was based on serologic evidence. Some infections were asymptomatic. Published studies note yearly infection rates among adolescents and adults vary from 1 to 6 percent based on serologic studies. So in general, the risk among healthcare personnel and the general population is comparable. Pertussis exposure management in healthcare settings is complicated, time consuming, and costly. Several studies have estimated the cost of investigation and control measures, which are substantial. However, Tdap vaccination would not change that. Current guidance on post-exposure prophylaxis for healthcare personnel is based on likely contact with patients at risk for severe disease and not Tdap vaccination status. One study looked at the need of post-exposure prophylaxis for Tdap, vac for Tdap vaccinated healthcare personnel, but results were inconclusive. Very few exposed healthcare personnel were infected, regardless of post-exposure prophylaxis or not. Infection was based on serologic evidence and none were asymptomatic, and none were symptomatic. These healthcare personnel were vaccinated within four years prior to their exposure. Since 2006, healthcare personnel have been recommended a single dose of Tdap and routine TD booster every 10 years. Hospital-based Tdap coverage rates vary, and a lot of effort has been put into increasing coverage from campaign, campaigns to hospital mandates. As we approach 10 years since the introduction of Tdap, national healthcare personnel coverage for the first dose is 31%. The benefits and costs of vaccinating healthcare personnel with Tdap were modeled previously to look at preventing a nosocomial pertussis outbreak. 
Vaccinating healthcare personnel was shown to substantially reduce the risk of hospital-based outbreaks and was cost-effective cost savings. But model inputs included Tdap vaccine efficacy estimates higher than current estimates and assumed vaccination would decrease transmission and prevent secondary cases. At this time, there's no direct evidence and the role of vaccination in transmission and prevention is unclear. There are plans to update the, the CDC's model. The work group has struggled with the lack of updated disease and vaccine specific data specific to healthcare personnel and are left with a number of uncertainties. Over the past several years, more has been learned about acellular pertussis vaccines. In acellular primed adolescents, Tdap is effective, but protection wanes substantially within a few years. For adults who are vaccinated with whole cell pertussis vaccines, Tdap provides protection but would be difficult to study or better characterize. And as the population ages, there will soon be more adults who received only acellular pertussis vaccines. Is the assumption valid that Tdap vaccination protects contacts? The evidence is unclear. Also, with the timing of any potential indication on additional doses of Tdap, does the committee wait or are we compelled to make an off-label recommendation? After much discussion, the workgroup has made the following assessments regarding pertussis and vaccinating healthcare personnel. The workgroup recognizes that pertussis transmission occurs in healthcare settings and that the frequency and proximity of patient interaction puts healthcare personnel at increased risk of exposure to pertussis. However, it is unclear how much pertussis exposure results in disease. There is a lack of updated data specific to healthcare personnel. The work group also recognizes that it is no small thing to implement recommendations for healthcare personnel. And there's no supportive evidence that additional doses would be beneficial in prevention of disease and transmission in a healthcare setting. And even if additional Tdap doses are recommended, there would be no change to risk management of pertussis exposure. At this time, the AC ACIP pertussis vaccine workgroup does not propose changes to the current Tdap recommendation for healthcare personnel. With a record of more than 48,000 pertussis cases reported in 2012 and 2014 numbers already higher than at this time last year, the workgroup does acknowledge the current resurgence of pertussis and the burden this places on state and local health departments and providers. The workgroup has expressed the desire for CDC to consider agency guidance on the role of repeat Tdap doses for healthcare personnel in response to outbreaks in healthcare settings. The CDC is considering potential guidance language for the CDC Pertussis website that would include encouraging consultation with their state public health and CDC during outbreaks in healthcare settings. Since each outbreak is unique and the guidance should be catered to the situation. The focus should be on the current Tdap program, improve adult coverage, including among healthcare personnel, and to vaccinate pregnant women during every pregnancy to protect infants. To end this session, I would like to mention some pertussis-related projects underway with our collaborators that would help address some data gaps. Results from these studies will be presented at future ACIP meetings. There are several vaccine effectiveness studies underway, including DTAP and Tdap vaccine effectiveness with the emergence of protactin negative strains. Through the Emerging Infections Program's Enhanced Pertussis Surveillance, we will be looking at the clinical characteristics of vaccinated and unvaccinated pertussis cases. Also through EIP's Enhanced Pertussis Surveillance, we are currently identifying reported, cases, reported pertussis cases who work in a healthcare setting and there are plans to update the cost effectiveness model for vaccinating healthcare workers. For the Tdap pregnancy recommendation, there is a cocooning and pregnancy Tdap evaluation and an infant blood spot study to measure the effectiveness of maternal Tdap against pertussis. And finally, I wanted to highlight additional CDC activities related to the Tdap pregnancy recommendation. Measuring Tdap coverage among pregnant women, the safety monitoring activities, and form informative research that is underway to develop a maternal Tdap vaccination campaign. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Dr. Liang. Uh, a quick question uh, from my end, uh, and it's more in terms of epidemiology, but how uh, transmittable is pertussis for someone who is asymptomatic, someone who's infected but, but not, not sick with it, so they, they don't have the characteristic catarrhal or paroxysmal phase, um, is that a, a risk? So, so, so for people who have been exposed to pertussis and may develop and are colonized and are asymptomatic, it's less likely or highly less likely for them to transmit because they're not coughing, so they're not actively um, spreading the bacteria. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Uh, Dr. Bennett? Just uh, curious about what the potential is for developing mandatory um, Tdap among healthcare workers. I mean, the the rates of thirty one percent are really striking, but that is where we were uh, probably five to ten years ago with influenza vaccine, and now we're really seeing um, a, a big uptick due to mandatory programs. Uh, I saw Dr. Weber. Dr. Today. Weber. So at uh, my hospital, uh, Tdap is a required vaccine, along with mumps, measles, rubella, varicella, and pertussis. And because it's required, we are 100% compliant, except for a few people who have medical contraindications. Uh, pertussis remains one of our most common exposures to our healthcare personnel. So over the last five years, roughly one out of 200 of our healthcare personnel each year has been exposed to pertussis. We do offer all of them uh, post-exposure prophylaxis with azithromycin and virtually all of them accept it. So we've had no healthcare workers in the last five years who have developed uh, pertussis. Uh, there were several, and I did discuss the recommendation. I appreciate the comments of the working group, and I'm on the working group, and the willingness to, uh, to listen. And certainly, I think at this time, the evidence really doesn't allow us to make an evidence-based recommendation for a revaccination. Uh, that said and done, a number of the concerns raised by the uh, Shea board when I discussed this with them is just the logistical problems if the uh, ACIP now recommends no revaccination and we passed a time period shortly uh, when 10 years have passed. One, we lose the budgeting. We've already budgeted many of us in the future for the vaccine. And as we all know, it's hard to recapture money once you've given it away. Second, our healthcare personnel at 10 years will begin getting their uh, 10-year uh, TD shots, and if sometime in the future, we, a few years later, the evidence supports a booster, that will make it more difficult, and uh, they'll be unhappy about they need, needing an extra uh, vaccine. And then finally, it's a bit contradictory that we're going to require or recommend that healthcare workers, and we give our, uh, all our vaccines, we require it as uh, for the incoming uh, medical students, nursing students, we've already heard how the vaccine wanes, so we're in fact immunizing people who are at relatively low risk, meaning first year nursing, medical students. The vaccine will wane, and yet we're going to continue recommending Tdap for that group. But at 10 years, when they're now junior attendings out on the wards, we're going to tell them they don't need a, a booster shot. So that's a bit uh, uh, difficult to sell, particularly to uh, as a requirement uh, for uh, uh, initial work. So those were some of the concerns raised among the board. And their feeling was if there is going to be data in the next few years that both modeling and, and obviously licensure of booster shots, it would be better to at least initially recommend a booster and then stop than to recommend no booster now and then try and reinstitute one in a few years. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. D Dr. Freyhofer. Uh, Sandra Freyhofer, and I'm speaking as the AMA uh, liaison to ACIP. Um, the AMA is meeting uh, next week uh, with the House of Delegates, and there's actually been a resolution introduced by the Oregon um, state delegation uh, with, that actually ex expresses confusion about Medicare coverage of TDAP, TDAP vaccination. So I wondered if you could clarify for the record Medicare coverage uh, for TDAP. Um, so, fine. So this is for Medicare. For this is for the 65 and older. So right now, um, Tdap coverage in Medicare is a plan, I believe Plan D. So meaning that it's not part of the routine um, Plan B series. So it's it, it's not covered under Medicare, from my understanding. I don't know if there's any other comments from 
Sam. Well, the specific question is about how to administer a Tdap within the office and get it covered. Could perhaps the CMS representative clarify that for us? Sure. This is Mary Beth Hans. Um, as Dr. Lane said, it is covered under Medicare Part D. Um, let me follow up and see if I can get some specific information from my Medicare colleagues during our break um, to answer your question um, to see if there's anything else they want to share. I think a follow-up question for that uh, pertains to uh, all the HIP recommended immunizations for our patients on Medicare and what type of rule changes would be possible to allow coverage for all HIP recommendations under Part B. Um, I have Dr. Pickering. Yeah, Jennifer, you mentioned that only 15% of pregnant women are receiving Tdap. So I wondered with Dr. Ald, our new liaison from ACOG, and Dr. Lair from AAFP as two of the organizations that deliver immunizations to pregnant women, what are you doing to try to increase coverage? Dr. Riley and I are both part of ACOG's immunization working group, and we have one of our strategies, and I think one of our more successful strategies, has been to provide what we call toolkits to uh, OBGYN physicians, and that includes uh, scripts and uh, other information that would help uh, providers. We're also doing a series of webinars uh, to, as, as kind of a multimedia exercise to uh, to inform OBGYN providers and office personnel that work in obstetrical offices about Tdap recommendations, and I suspect I'm probably missing something. So I'm looking at Dr. Riley to see if I'm missing anything. So apparently not. So the the recommendations are relatively new. I think the last time you put me on the spot, I said you know we have changed the recommendations about every six months or a year, but now they've been in place for about 15 or 16 months. If I'm doing the math right. And Dr. Lerner? The AAFP is also trying to um, pass on this information to as many family physicians as possible. And so it's disappointing that the rate is only 15%. Uh, I have uh, Dr. Baker, Dr. Harrison, Dr. Kemp. Well, I want to congratulate ACOG, and don't fate that I'm saying something nice about obstetricians. Uh, they've done a wonderful job in collaboration with the CDC media people on um, education, but not just healthcare providers, but um, pregnant women. Just shout out congratulations. Followed by, the continuing barrier is reimbursement. And I'll give just one example. California physicians deliver a lot of babies. It's a big state. California Medicaid does not pay for Tdap. So aside from the problem of buying the vaccine, storing it in the, you know, your office, all the other practical barriers to have something that would prevent death. And the UK has shown us that if you immunize pregnant women, you have over 90% vaccine effectiveness um, if you give it basically sometime in the third trimester. I mean, that's incredible uh, what they did. So I'm saying something nice about the Brits, too. Too bad Dr. David Sal Salisbury's not here. So this is something that has tremendous benefit. I love the increased safety uh, vigilance that's going on. I have an opinion of what it'll show, but I think it's wonderful to be able to get this kind of data when we stuck our necks out and made the recommendation for every pregnancy. So my, my issue here is back on CMS, I guess. Uh, you know, the, you, I hope you have a to-do list. Uh, Tdap reimbursement for pregnant women is an important issue for those well-meaning healthcare providers who actually know it's a recommendation have the ability to give it, and yet they won't be reimbursed at all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baker. And let the record show that Dr. Baker did say something nice about obstetricians and Brits. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Harrison. So this seems like a difficult battle with the current vaccines. Can we get a sense for what's going on in terms of development of next-gen vaccines from the manufacturers? Thank <laughs> you. 
I think I've addressed this here before, but uh, uh, Michael Dagger, Sanfi Pasteur. There we go. You know, I can shrink, it can grow. <laughs> The, I think all the manufacturers are looking to see what can be done about improved pertussis vaccines, but the structural uh, barriers are, are formidable. Uh, to give one example, um, I don't think anybody's figured out a way to license a new pertussis vaccine, certainly not a new infant vaccine. Um, the, uh, the regulatory authorities would require an endpoint clinical trial. Everybody knows that there's no accepted generic correlate of immunity for pertussis. It's vaccine specific. Every vac pertussis vaccine licensed, a cellular vaccine licensed around the world was licensed on the basis of a specific efficacy trial. You can't conduct those anymore in any practical way because there's no place in the world that doesn't recommend pertussis vaccine. The efficacy of a cellular pertussis vaccine in the primary series is in the high 90%. Um, and so the sample size needed to be able to, to meet non-inferiority requirements is larger than the population of any single country. Um, these are problems that have to be figured out. In addition, there's, there, although some work is being done on perfecting animal models, there's no animal model that's proven to be a valid correlate of the human response. Um, and so even answering the questions of what changes need to be made is formidable. So do the best you can with the vaccines you have because I can't tell you when you're going to have new ones. Uh, Leonard Frieda from GSK. In addition to our R&D group looking at how we can develop uh, new and potentially improved pertussis vaccines, our focus is exactly what's on this slide, is doing what we can to help the healthcare community understand how to improve adult coverage and elderly coverage of Tdap vaccines. And we're committed to generating data with maternal immunization with Tdap vaccines so that groups like yourselves can make informed decisions on how to use these vaccines safely and effectively in pregnant women. So that's our focus. Uh, Mr. Hausbeck, do you have a? Uh, Phil Hosbach from Santa Fe. Just only to reiterate what, what Len just said, I think I was really heartened to see that uh, we have a focus on improved, improving adult coverage, including healthcare uh, providers. Um, you know, hearing that immunization rates in pregnant women are only at about 15%, that's going to take a lot of work to raise those. So in the meantime, let's use the tool that we have and make sure that we are focusing on immunizing those who do take care of the infant. So that includes dad, that includes grandparents, that includes healthcare providers, that includes daycare. So I, we can't lose that. We're so focused on maternal immunization, and that's great because it's very targeted, looks to be very effective. However, it's going to take a while to get to 80, 90 percent. So let's use the tools that we have. I'm going to uh, get off cycle here a little bit and call uh, uh, Ms. Hans from CMS. Thank you. I just wanted to respond to um, Dr. Baker's comment on Medicaid coverage in California of um, Tdap, and I wanted to say that unfortunately, the way the Medicaid program exists right now, there is some disconnects in um, coverage of vaccines in general for adults, and it is an area that CMS is aware of. Um, under the Medicaid expansion all ACIP recommended vaccines are covered. So if you have an adult in Medicaid through the Medicaid expansion, they have coverage of all ACIP recommended vaccines. Since there are some women who are pregnant who are under age 21, they also would have coverage of the ACIP recommended vaccines through the um, early and periodic screening diagnosis and treatment program through the traditional Medicaid program. Where you have a gap is people who are in Medicaid, the traditional Medicaid program, who did not have coverage through the Medicaid expansion. This is a gap that was created with the Affordable Care Act, and it is a gap that CMS is aware of. It requires a legislative change, and this is something that is on our agenda and um, has been included in a couple of bills that probably aren't going to act, be acted on right now, but this is on our radar screen. So. But luckily, not, while not everyone has coverage that's an adult in Medicaid, there are larger numbers of adults in Medicaid. The other piece of the Medicaid program is that is it a state option. So while not all states um, choose to cover vaccines, and they can choose, they don't, it is not an all or nothing choice for states, there are a number of states who have chosen to cover some vaccines, and, um, and so even if they don't cover Tdap, they may cover, cover other vaccines recommended for um, by the ACIP. So again, this is an area we are aware of. We're hoping that at some point we will get to more across-the-board coverage. 
Um, and unfortunately, this is an example where there just isn't coverage for a certain section of the population. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, Dr. Kemp. I was just going to, um, related to our previous discussion, also shout out to ACOG um, in that I'm an implementation scientist and there are huge implementation issues to um, ACOG, you know, to, to OBGYNs beginning to deliver a lot of vaccines, not just the payment issues, but the the whole system development, et cetera. And um, ACOG has recently agreed and CDC is funding a survey unit within ACOG to really try to get at um, looking at the processes that are lacking and what OBGYNs need to, to more effectively deliver and what kind of systems they can adopt from other um, uh, specialties. So I just want to shout out to ACOG and thanks for helping us with that. Ms. Pellegrini. Thank you, Ali. I was going to make almost almost the identical point. I think the NVAC report that came out not too long ago on maternal immunization actually encapsulated most of these challenges really beautifully in showing that for OBGYNs who, who tr have not traditionally, who do not have a long history of considering themselves vaccinators, um, there is a substantial investment required up front in equipment, in the vaccine itself. There's a tremendous learning curve, storage issues. Um, and, and this is a really daunting prospect for a lot of practices. So we, we need to help them um, uh, address those obstacles. Dr. Middleman. Hi, Amy Middleman from um, Society for Ellison Health and Medicine. Um, I was just, uh, thank you for those great presentations. I was wondering if the working group is considering making the 10 year, the every 10 year booster dose a Tdap for ease of physician implementation and um, you know stocking issues and confusion I'm not fully aware of all the cost effectiveness issues but I'm wondering if that's been being considered I'm sorry dr. Mill it was hard to hear could you just repeat the question sorry sure I'm just wondering if there's any discussion at the working group level on whether or not the every 10 year booster um, could be a Tdap rather than TD in terms of, you know, stocking doses and, and physician implementation and ease of recommendation? I mean, so with regards to just the switch from the from a tetanus booster, every, a decennial TD to a decennial TDAP, um, I mean, this, this, is, this is what the work group has, has been considering, but I mean, looking really more at the single adding a second dose, um, this is tagging on to um, back in January of 2013 when when, ACE, when the work group first presented just considerations on the general population of additional doses. Because Tdap is only licensed for single use, you know, the guidance that we got from ACIP was to consider just adding a second dose and not moving beyond and expanding it to a decennial Tdap. Um, and so the conclusions for the second dose for the general populations was to not make any changes. And similarly with the healthcare personnel, we're not making any changes to the recommendation. And Dr. Baker. Just a quick question for Jennifer, because this question comes up all the time. You may be familiar that women sometimes have more than one pregnancy, and we know we're supposed to vaccinate them every time, but they seem to have family members, grandparents, et cetera, around the baby. Mm -hmm. So if they cocoon the first time, what do you, what's the CDC? I know the answer, it's for the public. What's the CDC position on revaccinating for the cocoon? So currently, so this is something that the working group has been discussing and we planned and hoped to present this at the February ACIP meeting. But when these calls come into CDC, our guidance really is, because it's only licensed for single use, just to make sure that all family members are up to date with their Tdap vaccination. Other uh, comments or questions? Yeah. After I made my comments, I realized that I had the ACOG app on my phone. And on the ACOG app, since we're all living in the 21st century now, you can download all the things I mentioned uh, previously if you download it to your Android or iPhone. And other questions? OK. we, we uh I think we are uh, to the end of pertussis. <laughs>